This is a video of our Belize uh, mission trip. So we take two international mission trips uh, every year. One is to Belize. That one's in the summer. Uh, the Uganda one is uh, usually in November. Um, usually the trips are populated pretty well. We're a little bit short on our Belize uh, crew this year. So really want to encourage you, if you've ever thought about um, going on an international mission trip, specifically to the one in Belize, uh, really want to have you considered uh, doing that this year. Um, we've had entire families that have gone before, uh, you know, parents and children. Um, we've had spouses that have gone before. You don't have to have any medical experience. It is a medical mission, but there's more than plenty enough uh, stuff to do if you're not a nurse or a doctor or a, or a pharmacist. Um, everyone that I have ever talked to uh, who has gone on the Belize mission trip uh, has come back as exceptionally blessed. Um, in fact, most of them have said it's been really one of the highlights of their life. So we've uh, moved back the registration a little bit. I think it's February 15th. All the, um, the deadline, all the information is in your bulletin. Um, I had a few people talk to me after the first service as well who are uh, really kind of praying about their place in the team and they're thinking they want to do it. So uh, I encourage you to uh, pray about if God is leading you to go on that trip. We would uh, love to have you join us on that. Um, Next week, uh, we're starting a new series. Uh, next week, um, it's a different type of sermon um, that I've done before. It's, it's called 50 Things I've Learned in 50 Years. Um, I'm a little bit concerned that the NFL has uh, scheduled uh, the Super Bowl on my birthday. Um, it uh, happens every seven years. So, so uh, if that's next week, I'm going to share with you uh, what I've learned throughout my life. And I'm excited about that. I'm not going to go over all 50 points in depth. Um, We'll still get you out of here in pretty close to an hour, but uh, that one's next week. And then over the next few weeks after that, you'll hear some other voices. Uh, you know, they're going to reflect on their past. They're going to look at their future. Um, and we all need to do that. Um, you're going to have a chance to do that as well. We're going to provide you some resources to uh, reflect on your past, evaluate the present, and, and dream about the future. Now, dreaming about the future is uh, uh, something we've been doing uh, the last three weeks. Uh, the sermon series is called... 2020 vision. Uh, some of you have done this. Uh, you've sent in your vision. Some of you have uh, still marinating and uh, percolating. And you know, that's fine as well. Um, God will give us the vision when we're ready. And uh, today we're going to talk about how to make that uh, vision a reality. So most of you probably wouldn't know who uh, Roald Admanson is. Um, you'll see his picture on the screen behind me. So in 1911, um, there was a race uh, to get to the South Pole to see who can get there the fastest. He was racing a man whose name was Robert Falcon Scott. Both teams uh, set off on this journey in 1911. Now, Ad Admundsen was uh, a Norwegian, so he's a good guy in the story. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so what he, what he did is he spent several years preparing for this trip. He didn't take it lightly. Um, he got all the supplies they thought was necessary, and everyone said, like, he has way too many supplies. He doesn't need this much. He thought through every worst-case scenario that he could. Um, in fact, he actually even lived with uh, Eskimos for about a year just to see how to thrive in uh, Arctic conditions. Now, Scott was from England. He didn't plan as much. He was very experienced. Uh, he usually used his intuition on smaller trips. Um, he did surround himself with a, a bunch of uh, really good people. So they started about the same time. Um, Admundsen and his Norwegian crew, uh, every day, uh, without exception, regardless of the conditions, regardless of how they felt, they would go about 15 miles or so. Scott and his people, uh, it really kind of depended upon the weather and you know how, uh, how some of them felt. Some days they would actually go further than 15 miles. Some days uh, they wouldn't really go that far at all. So it was Admundsen that got to the South Pole. Um, Scott and his team got fairly close, but they had to turn around and as they were headed back to where their ship was, uh, they all perished. Um, now, they both had the vision, right? Like, just like you all have a vision, like, they both had the vision. The vision is to get to the South Pole. Now, one of them made it. Um, he completed the vision. One of them didn't make it. You know, so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the attributes uh, of how to fulfill a vision. We're going to look at this, uh, not through anything I thought up of. Um, we're going to look at this uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, where we're going to learn from Jesus and what he did to uh, fulfill God's vision in, in his life. Now, um, I loved reading your, uh, 
your visions this week. Um, I'd occasionally get a little spreadsheet of them, you know, sent them in on the website, and I'd basically stop what I was doing. I'd open up the spreadsheet, and I would, like, read these visions. I'd see whose name it was. Um, and I'd, I'd always pray for, you know, y'all. I thought it was just amazing to read these, and I was so excited that, like, this is the person that you're hoping to become. These are the things that you're hoping to do in uh, 2020. Habakkuk 2, 2, uh, we've looked at this one every week. Um, it says, write the vision down, put it on tablets, get it in front of you. You know, so even if you're not there yet, uh, you got the little sheet in your, uh, your chair, write it down. Um, you know, put it on the tablet. Uh, the spiritual vision, then like one non-spiritual vision. Um, now at the end of the service, um, we're actually going to practice something that was instituted in Matthew chapter 26. So the first few things I'm going to look at are the start of Matthew 26, and there's uh, the blessing of the Lord's Supper, which is what we'll do at the end of the service. Then I do talk about um, the end of Matthew 26 during the sermon as well. And what I want you to do, if it's your first time here and you're not ready to give us your vision, um, like take it with you and write on the tablets, take it home and put it in a place where you're going to get it. If, if you've been with us and you're not quite there yet, uh, take it home and uh, consider it. But if you got your vision down or if you come up with it this morning, I um, really want to encourage you to write it on the sheet of paper and bring it up during communion. You know, put it in the, uh, put it in the baskets and on all the metal things around the sides of the sanctuary, we're going to uh, put your visions up there. If you want to put your name on it, put it at the top uh, left-hand corner. If you don't want to put your name on it, um, if it's too personal, that's fine as well. But I want us to write these visions down. Um, I, I think that's the way they happen. Um, love some of your visions. Uh, one of them... Um, it was one of the first ones I got was uh, to be a partner more and control less. So this was from someone who was married, and I'm assuming she was talking about her marriage, that this is going to be the case. And so many possibilities on this one, uh, to control less or to yeah, control less and be a partner more. So you can't experience emotional intimacy over someone that you control. Um, you just can't do it. So... I pray that, like, through this partnership, um, this couple is able to experience all new sorts of uh, intimacy that they couldn't experience with one person controlling the other. Um, love this one. To have uh, family gatherings, monthly family gatherings, uh, to counter everyone's busy schedule. Plan it and make a priority. Yeah, so everyone's busy schedule. If your schedule's like ours, there's... Uh, Youth sports, there's uh, activities, there's work obligations, there's a million things that we can say uh, yes to. But I love what this woman wrote, um, uh, despite the busy schedules to have these monthly gatherings. And I think it's going to be awesome when uh, her and her husband and her kids and her grandkids uh, get together. And they're, they're going to say, you know, one night a month, we're going to say no to culture and their expectations of us, and we're going to say yes to our family. And, like, that's this really cool thing. Um, the kid can miss a game, you can miss a function, um, but the family, they get together, and I love that vision. Uh, the next one I have is to uh, listen to understand and, and not to respond. Uh, this is great. 80% um, of the quality of our communication is going to be uh, listening. You know, 20% of it's going to be the words we say, and if this person can listen to understand, um, the communication between uh, this person and everybody else is going to dramatically improve because uh, they're understanding the other person. They're going to be able to communicate well because of that. Um, to set aside one hour of uh, prayer each week to identify, celebrate, and journal about God's presence in my life. Um, so I was thinking about that when I first read it, like an hour a week. Um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a lot, but then I thought gosh, you know, if this person's able to pull this off, um, and they would come up to me and they would say, you know, Craig, I'm going to spend 52 hours with God this year. Um, I would say that's like this really cool feat you're doing. You know, so this person's broken it down into bite-sized pieces, and uh, he or she, um, you know, through this weekly discipline, is going to spend 52 hours with God. Um, love this one. To let those in society uh, who are told... Um, that God does not love them, know that he actually does love them. Um, this one's very apostolic. This one takes some guts. This one takes a little bit of courage, uh, you know, to go out there to the marginalized people, to go out there to the hurting people, to go out there to the broken people, to go out there to uh, just 
all sorts of people and let them know that God loves them. Um, this one takes guts. I, 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 I love this one. Um, I'll improve my health uh, by losing weight as I've planned for years. So this has been a vision before, um, as I've planned for years. But she's going to try it again. I will, I will do this so that I'll feel better and I'll feel more comfortable when I travel to Australia to visit my son and his family. Um, so she's got two really good reasons. She wants to feel better and she wants to be more comfortable when she uh, you know, travels to see her, her son and her grandkids. And um, you know, it, it hasn't worked out for her in the past, but I, I believe that this year it will. And here's how these things happen. Um, here's how these things happen. Uh, number one, um, you make a schedule. You, know, you put it on a calendar, do whatever. Like psychologists will tell you like how people change is they schedule change. You know, change doesn't happen randomly, change doesn't happen on accident, it happens intentionally. And the most intentional thing that we can do to change is to schedule change. Um, you know, so like let's say we got one that said and we got a number of these. Uh, I want to spend more time with my kids. Um, so how do you do that? Like you put it on the calendar. You say, okay, uh, like three nights every week and one day every weekend. I'm going to devote most of my time to these kids who are never going to be young again. You know, so between 6 p.m. and 8 p.m., I'm going to turn off my phone, I'm going to turn off my email, I'm going to turn off my mind. And I'm not just going to be physically present with these little kids who aren't going to be a little much longer, but I'm going to be emotionally present with them as well. And then on, uh, you know, Saturday morning, um, they get the whole morning with me. Uh, they may get more time, but it's on my schedule that if anyone asks me to do things, uh, I say no because I already have an appointment with uh, these two kids that I said in my vision are going to be my priority. Um, someone said to uh, read the Bible um, five days a week for ten minutes a day and then pray uh, for the understanding of uh, the reading. Love this one. I love uh, the specificity of it. They give himself a little bit of grace to fail, not seven days a week, five days a week. Um, they're not doing it for an hour. They're doing it for 10 minutes. It, it, it's doable. Um, now, here's how it's going to be doable. It's going to be doable if they do it when they wake up in the morning um, before you do anything else. It's going to be doable if uh, after you get off work and you're getting ready to drive home, um, you sit in your car for 10 minutes and you read the scriptures and you reflect on it. Um, before the evening drive. Maybe for some of us, we're night owls, and um, we want to immerse ourselves in God's word before we go to sleep. So you schedule it, you know, 10 minutes before you go to sleep at night. Um, love this one, too, uh, um, to complete rag with my two teenagers. So if you want to do this, I looked it up. I'm going to help you out here. Uh, you have to block off July 19th through July 25th on your calendar. Um, there's no work. There's no youth sports camps. You've got to figure out what to do with a dog. But if you want to ride across Iowa with, like, 10,000 other people, um, you've got to schedule this one or it's not going to happen. So in Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 and 2, when, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, uh, he said to his disciples, as you know, Passover begins in two days, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Now, what's the vision that Jesus had? The vision that Jesus had was a vision that his father gave him. It's a vision from the Old Testament that he was coming to fulfill. The vision was that he was going to die a humiliating and a painful death. He was going to raise from the dead, and he was going to give all of us sinners uh, he was going to give all of us an abundant life here in this world and an uh, eternal life in the world to come. That's the vision. Um, now, I'm imagining, uh, I'm imagining that um, Jesus was having the time of his life during his ministry. He was teaching people. He would tell uh, people who couldn't walk, uh, get out of your wheelchair and walk. He would tell people who uh, couldn't hear, you can now hear. He would touch the eyes of a blind person. All of a sudden, they could see. Um, he would go forgive people of their sins. Like, he had this amazing thing going on. I'm imagining that, um, you know, a couple days of uh, pure misery and agony wasn't uh, at the top of his list of priorities, but it was on the schedule. You know, he knew it was coming to Passover. Um, you know, in two days, uh, I'm going to be handed over to be crucified, and let's figure out what happens after that. Um, now, I, this one I love. This is one of my favorite ones. Um, 
My vision is to pray with my wife daily until it becomes something we can't sleep without completing. So I know that one specific person turned this into me, but I want to talk to everyone who's uh, married. I think this would be a really great vision um, for 2020 for you. I can be truthful, I'll be honest here, like um, the first time you do this, if you haven't done it before, you know, hashtag awkward. Um, it's like the most intimate form of uh, communication that you're ever going to experience. Um, but I'll tell you what, if this couple is able to pull this off, if anybody else, because this couple mentioned this and I'm talking about it, is able to pull it off, um, this is one thing, probably the one thing, the one best thing that you can do um, to improve your marriage. You get to listen to the fears of another person, uh, to share the hopes and the dreams, to give thanks for the day, you know, to pray for your children, whether they're two months old or 48 years old. Like, schedule it. Like, that's the only way it's going to happen. You do it when you wake up, you do it before you go to bed. Um, it's not going to happen unless you schedule it. Like, you know what? Tonight, before we go to sleep, um, we're just going to start off with a basic prayer and we're going to thank God for each other. You know, then the next night, you get to a little bit more uh, uh, depth prayer, and you say, you know, let's just share something we're afraid of. And the next night, you share a dream you have. The next night, you pray for your kids, and all of a sudden, you got to have it. you got to schedule, and it happens every night before you go to bed, and your, your marriage is experiencing intimacy like you've never experienced it before. All right, number two, um, make a budget. So I went through all these. It took me a while. Um, and I put a little check mark on all of them that required money and uh, all of them that don't require money. 85% of the visions that you gave me do not require money. I want to talk to the 15% uh, that do uh, because there's some good stuff in here. Um, one person said, I want to do something uh, I'm afraid of and haven't been able to do before. I want to join a gym so that I can start exercising and feel physically better. So... Set the budget, um, you know, depending on where you go. I guess you're going to pay between like $20 a month and, you know, probably $80 a month for a single membership. Um, you know, so that would be the investment. That's the budget. It's now part of who you are. Put it in the budget. And I would say, you know, if you've never done this before and, like she says, uh, to do something I'm afraid of and I haven't been able to do before, I would say put it in the budget to hire someone to help you. Like most gyms have like a trainer. Um, you know, hire this person like, you know, four times or eight times or whatever. Um, you're going to show up if you're paying them. Um, they're going to show you how to be successful in the future. They're going to show you things you can do so that when you come on your own, you're going to be successful. Like this is an investment. Um, for us to succeed in our visions, we got to put in the budget. There was, uh, I got a number of these. This is probably one of the more popular ones. Um, it, it said, and I'm just putting all these together, to invest in memories and not stuff. Now, there's some memories that are going to be totally free. You can go to the park across the street and play Frisbee or fly a kite. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, if you want to take a trip to Denver and see the mountains, if uh, you want to take a trip and drive across the sand hills, um, I was thinking you could uh, uh, take 12 dates this year if you're a married couple, and if you could try to find Omaha's best burger, um, you wouldn't find it because it comes from my grill, but you could look for Omaha's... Uh, <laughs> Second best burger, just like the best chili comes from my kitchen, which uh, all of you will experience in a few weeks. Um, I was actually thinking about naming the chili cook-off Beat Pastor Craig uh, since I've won two of the last three years, but uh, that's just stuff, you know. Um, you can rent a cabin at Mahoney or Platte River State Park. You can go on a marriage retreat. Um, yeah, so we got a budget for some of it. Um, while he was eating, a woman came over in verse 7. Um, with a beautiful alabaster jar of expensive perfume and uh, poured it over his head. So you know what the disciples said after this? They said, well, that's a waste. Like, she dumped this expensive perfume on your head. Like, that's a total waste of money. And, um, but it wasn't, right? Because she budgeted for what was important for her. Her vision was, you know, she knew Jesus was going to die, and she wanted to prepare him for the burial. So she dumps a perfume on the head, and Jesus, uh, in verses 10 through 13, but Jesus, aware of this, replied, why, why criticize this woman for doing such a good thing to me? You know, you'll always have the poor among you, but you're not always going to have me. 
She poured this perfume on me to prepare my body for burial. I tell you the truth. Whenever good news is preached throughout the world, this woman's deed will be remembered and discussed. That's what we're doing this morning. We're remembering and we're discussing this woman's good deed because what she did is she budgeted for her vision. Her vision was to give Jesus a proper burial, or at least do her part. So she dumped what she had, her expensive perfume, on him so he could get that kind of grace. Now, um, this one is, uh, this one works for this. So I only got this one once, to quit working and spend more time with my children and God. Beautiful vision. Um, I'm not criticizing any mom that uh, goes out and works. Amber, she's worked uh, you know, throughout our married life. Um, you know, this woman has a, a vision to do this, but before uh, she does this, um, her and her husband, have to, they have to sit across the kitchen table from each other, and they have to count the costs. They have to you know, budget for this. You know, do we have the resources, do we have the financial resources to, to make this possible? Are we willing to um, give up something so that you can have this, th- this thing? Now, I, I, I wouldn't recommend anyone like, go out and quit your job and spend more time with your kids. I would recommend, if you're thinking about doing this, to, to budget first, and that's what they're going to do. Um, you know, it may very well work out. Like, you know, we can't quite do this anymore. We're not going to be able to do this. We can't buy this. We'll have to put off buying this. Um, but we can make this work. You know, you count the cost. Number three, uh, you ask for help. So how many of us love this one? You love asking for help. Who loves asking for help? Um, yeah, so not too many of us, just Corey. You're the only one, Corey, and that's why we love you. Um, <laughs> I remember when I was uh, in... 2016, I took a sabbatical. Um, I was gone most of the summer, and one of the things I did during the summer was I <clears throat> uh, took a comedy class in New York City, and I performed at a, the Gotham Comedy Club on a Saturday night. I was like the, I was like the warm-up act, the warm-up act for like the main guy. So uh, they gave me seven minutes. They had a clock in the back. It started at seven minutes and it went down to zero. And they said the power to the mic goes off at seven minutes, so that's all you get. Um, so the first day we had class, um, learned a lot. Um, then they gave us like this daunting assignment. You got three hours uh, to go out and write a, a four-minute script um, that you're going to perform tonight in front of all your classmates. So I was one of the oldest people in the class. Uh, most of them were kind of in their 20s and 30s. Um, I was the only Midwesterner. I think I was probably the only Christian in the class. And I got up and... Um, uh, have you ever heard, like, the phrase, died on stage before? <laughs> yeah, that's what happened with me, and I finally understood what that stage meant, or that phrase meant. And, uh, you know, so I had a couple kind of good jokes in there, and um, I met with uh, the guy that was teaching the class. He's a writer for Saturday Night Live. Uh, his name's Steven Rosenfeld, and he says, you know, Craig, I was sitting there, and I, I felt sorry for you. Um, <laughs> you're, like a, you're like a fish out of water. Um, he says, now, you had a few things in there, um, like, you had a couple church things in there, and, like, I didn't think it, was, it would work, but that stuff was gold. He says, you know, we've never had a pastor on stage before. Um, he says, like, tomorrow, like, write church stuff. And so I went and I wrote church stuff, and uh, I wrote corny church stuff that no one thought was funny. Um, you know, so I met with uh, Stephen the next day, and, like, he talked to me. We worked on this thing. I talked to him again later. Um, So all of a sudden, that was the warm-up act for the warm-up act for the main guy. And um, I get up in front of all these people at this comedy club in New York City, and I say, hey, I'm a pastor. Um, And they all started laughing. Um, I wasn't even trying to make them laugh. They laughed. And uh, I was like, hey, this is going to work. And I said, I got a friend that's an atheist, and uh, she once asked me if uh, it bothers uh, me that she's an atheist. And I thought about it for a second, and I said, it doesn't bother me. I'm not the one going to hell. Um, (laughs) And then, uh, you know, I've been teaching people about prayer for the last 15 years, and uh, I actually learned how to pray last night in the back seat of a New York City taxi cab. And, uh, you know, I do uh, uh, talk to couples, you know, this one couple came in, they were telling me that they had their 50th wedding anniversary, and their kids got them uh, three sessions of uh, marriage and family therapy for their uh, uh, 50th wedding anniversary, and they went in there because they just didn't like each other, they didn't get along, and... Um, you know, the therapist got so frustrated that he went up and he, um, like, hugged the woman and he kissed her and he looked at the man and he says, this needs to happen three times a week. 
And uh, the man thought about it for a second. He says, okay, I'll bring it around on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I had seven minutes of this stuff. And uh, um, there is absolutely no way I could have done it without someone's help. You know, so if you want to be a closer follower of Jesus Christ, um, I don't think you can do it alone. I think you need someone to help you. Uh, you know, if you want to... Uh, um, experience more intimacy in life, you definitely need someone's help with that one. If uh, I, I would say if you want to do something you've never done before, I don't know if you're going to be able to do it on your own. I think you need someone to help you. Uh, okay, Jesus asked for help. If Jesus asked for help, I think that uh, that gives all of us permission. Uh, and I would say even like this, uh, this imperative that we ask for help. Then Jesus uh, went with them. To the olive grove, uh, we're in verses 36 through 38, called Gethsemane, and he said, um, he said, sit, sit here while I, I go over there to pray. So he took uh, Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed, and he told them, um, notice what he says, he's asking for help here. He says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Like he knew that he was going to have to say goodbye. He knew that he was going to die. He knew that the world was messed up, and uh, he was leaving that world that he came to fix. Um, so, th so then he said, stay here and, and keep watch with me. Jesus said, I, I can't do this alone. I need your help. I need you to stay here and, and, uh, and pray with me and, and do this with me. Now, if Jesus asks for help, um, no matter how simple or how complex your vision is, how simple or complex my vision is, ask for help. You know, I uh, love this one. Um, retain a financial advisor, identify my financial goals, and record weekly my progress in achieving my goals. I know this person. He's not a finance guy. Um, he knows that he can't get to where he wants to go on his own, so he's going to talk to a financial advisor. Um, wonderful advice. Uh, number four, uh, remember why you started. Remember why you started. Um, in 2020, I'm going to heal from the emotional pain that I experienced in 2019. If you're sitting out there, I want you to hear this. There's going to be a time that you don't want to have that tough conversation. You know, there's going to be that therapist or counselor that you don't want to call and make that first session. There's going to be that pastor that uh, you avoid talking to for some spiritual direction because uh, it's just not the easy thing to do, to admit our weakness. You know, but when that starts to creep into your mind, you know, remember why you started. You want to get better, and you're not going to get better on your own. So call the pastor, call the therapist, have the tough conversation with a friend, go to the grief group, read the book. Um, he went a little further in verse 39 and bowed with his face to the ground. This is what he prays. Je Jesus prays this. My father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. I don't want to make that call. I don't want to have that conversation. I don't want to do that thing. Um, but then he doesn't quit there, though. Jesus doesn't quit there. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. I want my healing to happen. I want to get better. I don't want to be this way anymore. Remember why you started. When there's that temptation to quit, remember why you started. You want to get better. You want to feel better. You want to be a bigger, bigger blessing. Um, loved, uh, love these two. Um, they're, they're basically the same. Um, to be intentional about my words building others up, giving grace and love in all situations. The next one is uh, gossip less, not engage in other conversations uh, that are considered gossip. So when gossip comes your way, um, you know, when there's a chance to you know, criticize and not encourage. I want you to remember why you started. And for those of you who wrote this, I think the reason that you started is because there was a day that somebody said something that really hurt you. And you don't want to be that person. 
you know, you want to use good words, holy words, sacred words. Words are so powerful. We remember those times that people have used those words to us, and it's been such a blessing. We, we remember those times that people have said really harsh things to us, and that's been a curse. You know, so when the temptation happens to say those words, remember why you started. And the last one is to uh, persevere. Um, you know, so here we're looking at uh, the end of chapter 26. This is after the institution of the Lord's Supper. Uh, verses 65 through 68. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show the whore and said, Blasphemy. Um, why do we need other witnesses? You've, you've heard all this blasphemy. What is your verdict? And so he, he's looking at here at, at the people that Jesus came to save. Jesus was there, and, and here's what the people who Jesus came to save said. They said, guilty. Um, he deserves to die. Then they spit in Jesus' face, and they beat him with their fist, and some of them slapped him, jeering, prophecy to us, you Messiah. Who hit you this time? You know, so what's happened is the creation has turned on the creator. The very people that Jesus has uh, come to save um, are sending him to his grave. So what did he do? Did he quit? He said, no. He didn't quit. He, he continued. You know, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know, so they beat him some more, and like he took the cross on his back, and they threw these uh, crown of horn, thorns on, it, on his forehead, and did he quit? He continued. He took another step. You know, when he's up on the cross, um, he could have delivered himself off the cross. He raised a dead person. He feed 5,000 people with uh, a few loaves of bread and a couple fish. But he didn't do it. He continued. He persevered. One of the ones I loved this week was uh, uh, to, to be the caregiver for my wife um, as she recovers from an illness serving uh, her best interests with grace and gratitude. So I remember it was the week of Thanksgiving. I was in a hospital room, and I was in the room with two women I knew. One was laying in the bed fighting for her life, and the other was her daughter who was by her side. There was uh, two other siblings and three uh, uh, boyfriends and girlfriends. The man who wrote this wasn't in town. He was out of town, uh, caring for his uh, brother. Um, he's on his way to Omaha. And I'm not a doctor. I've been in hospitals enough to know when people are going to live and when people are going to die. And I really sensed that she wasn't going to make this one. Um, you know, I remember praying for him. I remember leaving. Uh, and this man has persevered. Um, he's been by her side the whole way. Uh, and he remembers the reason why. For better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. You know, her recovery has been amazing. She's probably watching online this morning. Um, she'll be back in church with us someday. Um, it's going to be a while, but she'll be back here amongst us someday. Those of you in her Bible study know very well who I'm talking about. Um, but it's going to be easy to quit. But don't. Persevere. Continue. You know, when, when it gets tough, you remember why you started. So Jesus was uh, having his last meal in the middle of all these conversations, and uh, Jesus was full of grief, the Bible says, right? Um, Jesus was uh, dealing with fear in his life, and Jesus, he took the bread the night before the Passover, during the feast, and he, he broke the bread, he blessed it, and said, friends, this is my, this is my uh, body that is given for you when you eat of this, do so in uh, remembrance of me. And uh, when we remember Jesus uh, this morning, we get to remember the one who uh, persevered, you know, the one who didn't quit, but, but he continued, and because he continued, um, all of us are now beyond blessed. And after the supper, he took the cup and blessed it and gave thanks and passed it around for everyone to drink and told them, you know, this is a new covenant. My blood shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. And, and as that went around, what he was telling them was, you know, this is a new vision of what life is going to look like for you guys. There's not going to be this guilt and shame anymore. You guys are going to live as forgiving people. 
Um, you don't have to be perfect anymore. You have this forgiveness in your life. And as you look at those uh, vision cards that you have, if you're still thinking about a spiritual one, uh, a vision of living as a forgiven person can totally transform your life. Um, that's going to change your relationship with God and with the other people in your life, and it's, it's really going to change your relationship with yourself. So let's go to God and let us pray. Almighty God, we pray uh, for this bread and this uh, juice that is before us. God, we pray that um, uh, this meal is a blessing to us. We, Lord, receive this with each other, and we receive this with, with you. Um, Lord, I, I do pray that we remember. You tell us to take and eat and drink this in remembrance of you. And God, I pray we remember that uh, you had this vision, and this vision wasn't easy, but this vision was fulfilled. And because you have this vision for us, we can have these new dreams and hopes and possibilities and visions for uh, a greater and a brighter future. And Lord, it was your vision that all of us uh, live as forgiven people. And I pray, God, that uh, whether it's on our little card or not, that as we come forward, we can... Uh, experience the grace of your forgiveness, God, that you will help us to uh, get past our past and also share the same forgiveness you give us with, with others. So, Lord, uh, together now in one voice, we come and pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, so if you're uh, new with us, um, you are encouraged. Uh, you are welcome. Um, I invite you to come forward and receive communion with us here at the Water's Edge. We believe that we are all children of God, that we are all brothers and sisters to Jesus Christ and his grace is available to all of us. Um, so how you do this is you'll be given a piece of bread, you'll dip the bread in the juice, and then you'll eat the bread that has been drenched in the juice. If you're on a gluten-free diet, uh, you'll come through uh, me and Pat's uh, row here, and we will be blessed and honored to serve you. Uh, for those of you who have uh, filled out your vision cards, uh, I encourage you to bring those forward. Um, for those of you in the middle of the back, if you have not done yours yet, uh, you can use this as a time of reflection. And Maybe God uh, gives you a vision, and um, I believe he'll do that for some of us. So uh, your uh, greeters are going to let you out um, and have you come forward. Uh